acknowledging that Concordia University is located on unceded indigenous lands. The Kanyogehaga uh, Nation is recognized as the custodians of the lands and waters on which we gather today. Chuchage, uh, Montreal, is historically known as a gathering place for many First Nations. Today, it is home to a diverse population of indigenous and other peoples. We respect the continued connections with the past, present, and future and our ongoing relationships with indigenous and other peoples within the Montreal community. Um, also, I'd like to begin uh, by, uh, I'd like to acknowledge and apologize for the fact that uh, while all three speakers bring forward different perspectives on the climate crisis, um, this panel does not include gender diversity. Um, we obviously all need to be more consciously and actively try to learn from diverse range of experiences. And uh, so I, I just want to say I'm committed to keep on improving in future events on, on that on that side. So um, I'd like to introduce our, um, our speaker, Carolis, our host, Carolis, sorry. Um, he's a PhD candidate and a public scholar at Concordia University in Montreal, Canada, a recipient of the Quebec Lieutenant Governor Youth Medal. He leads the Waste Not Want Not Com Compost Initiative at Concordia. Uh, since the beginning of Waste Not Want Not in 2016, the Concordia community doubled its annual composting and each Concordian reduced their overall waste by the equivalent of two months every year uh, relative to what they used to generate in 2015. Um, we have Edmund Metatowaben, a residential school inmate, an activist for justice, a former chief, and is an author of three books. He received an Order of Canada from the government and a war bonnet from, um, from the elders. After 30 years of employment, Edmund went into business, running a sawmill, uh, doing consulting work, speaking, uh, speaking engagements, listening to oral stories, and coordinating land-based uh, expeditions for youth. Time on the land helps youth get familiar with their, ter their history, sacred land areas, legends, and local heroes. Edmund and his family are involved in the local operations of a farmer's market, bringing fresh produce and food to the community. In retirement, Edmund votes time to continue working on major projects documenting Inino life before European contact. In their time, trading activities um, took the Ininuuk to the land of the Inuit east-west and as far, as, as far south as South America. Um, Robert Green, born in South Thomas, Ontario, but grew up in Toronto. Uh, he did a BA in Religious Studies and a Graduate Diploma in Community Economic Development at Con U. Uh, it's his 15th year teaching. Uh, he's taught history, contemporary world, AP, com uh, comparative government and politics, ethics and religious culture, philosophy, financial education, and English. Uh, fun fact, um, he was a CSU president in 1999 and in 2000, so two years back to back, uh, he organized a strike that succeeded in stopping a fee increase and provided the crucial support for the founding of the People's Potato, which we still uh, is still running today. And um, Professor Moore um, of U of T teaching physics, focused research in high altitude climate dynamics, mountain meteorology, and high altitude physiology. Um, so these are our speakers today, um, and I give the floor to uh, Kiro. Oh, um, hi, Al. Well, thank you very much, uh, Malcolm, for inviting me to contribute to such a wonderful event. And I'm also thankful for the opportunity to work uh, on this event with Manuela, the CSU's uh, previous uh, sustainability coordinator. I'm sure she'll agree with me that her, her portfolio is in, remains in, in capable hands with Amy. Uh, it's a privilege to meet all of you today. Uh, I got so excited by the opportunity to learn from the many different conversations that your different perspectives bring. And so I made a list of 22 questions, including sub questions and, and follow up. So I'm, I'm just gonna jump right into it. Um, so Edmund, uh, maybe uh, I can, I'd like to start with you. It has become custom at all events at Concordia to start with, with land acknowledgements, including today. And I'm curious, what are your thoughts on these kind of acknowledgement and if you find them helpful? <clears throat> Are you directing to me? Uh, Ed, Edmund. Yes. Edmund. Okay. So the uh, acknowledgement, um, I read your document and um, it's, um, it's a direction. Uh, I, I hear this uh, more and more, this, this kind of acknowledgement, but um, it's actually, uh, for me, I, I would like to speak on the, uh, the responsibility, never mind the uh, whoever is the, uh, the object of this uh, program, but more the uh, responsibility of the in 
of the institution as an agent to deliver knowledge to people that seek knowledge. So one of these knowledge areas, uh, you could use the term First Nation uh, people knowledge, indigenous knowledge, uh, traditional knowledge, uh, native studies, uh, many words that you can use to uh, focus on this um, kind of study. But being on this land for a long time, 10,000, 15,000 years on this land and the same area, and finding satisfaction within that area, uh, growing, developing, teaching, observing, and surviving, we have uh, acquired a way of believing, a way of teaching, an area of knowledge. And if a university wants to get in that uh, business of delivering uh, education to uh, those that seek knowledge, then that university becomes a place where you go to find knowledge, to discover knowledge, knowledge areas, and to pursue uh, for your own sake and for others. So you pursue an area of knowledge. And I think for the university, it to do justice to everybody, it must expand the knowledge areas that it delivers. And um, indigenous people have been here for a long time. It should have been one of the first ones uh, delivered by the university because it's a very significant uh, knowledge area. So it's that's what I think about that. It's it's a university's responsibility to deliver knowledge to those everyone um, that seeks to expand their knowledge. So that's my comment on that. Thank you. Thank you very much. And. Um... It's, it's totally one of the things that are that are, are lacking of um, having studied here at Concordia since I was undergrad. I've been here since 2009, and, and it's it's one of the things that I've, I've never got to learn so much about or enough about at all. So I um, definitely appreciate that. I think I jumped the gun a little bit when I started my questions. I, I understand that the speakers should have a presentation at the very beginning. So I think uh, Ed uh, goes first, uh, as far as I understand. Uh, so the floor is yours. Okay. We'll get there. <clears throat> I get very excited um, with questions, so I started. <laughs> <laughs> okay, hello everybody. Greetings, Bojo, um, uh, everybody. Ninenan Maguina, Ninenok, and Deshenakasunan. Ashwesh Chodan Destanan. Egumage, Egwane Destako, Ninenan, Ayam Hitiak. So we've been here for a long time. Our whole oral history dates back a long, long time ago, even to the point of saying Ehip. Ehip, the great spider. Um, met two young people that were on the run or had to get away. And um, they talked about the, uh, the lower world. So to make a long story short, Ahab decides to help these people. First, the two people that were uh, initial ones. And then eventually the other people said, well, we, we want to go too. So we have a history of moving from the upper world into the lower world. And the lower world is, if you look up, we are lower. So that's where the, uh, the story um, starts, I suppose. But we end up in Nawashi. Nawashi is um, south of Hudson Bay and west of James Bay, highlands. And 12,000 years ago, 
there was a significant event. Um, Plato calls it a flaming chariot in the sky. And a piece of that chariot fell down to earth, causing a, a tremendous change in the way people lived. And the people on, in this area find themselves in the island of Nawashi, the island of giants. And they were there for 6,000 years. And they produced songs, dances. They had a fasting rock for the young people. They observed thunderbird aches and from, uh, from the spirits, from the grandfathers. The songs were varied, the dances in celebration for having life, for having found a place to raise family. After, after the initial 6,000 years, the water was receding. The island became landlocked. So could see the water no more except for lakes and other bo uh, small bodies of water. And they said, well, it's time to go. They, they went north and they encountered the waters of Hudson Bay. And they turned uh, to the east a little bit, and that was Moshawa, flatland, grassland. And I haven't discovered grass, a different kind of vegetation. A ceremony became important to understand and get help from the spiritual side. And this is where the sweet grass, the sage, came into use, and also the use of ceremony. The ceremonies, again, became very many. The water drum ceremony, and uh, the uh, use of different kinds of drums, the water drum, the hand drum, the power drum. So a lot of uh, celebration of life for having found uh, a place to live. Now they, they also developed a philosophy in you know, all during this time, during this um, finding meaning into their life. They said, in all things we do, this for those that are not yet born. And in terms of sustainability, it is more like for a secure future, this, uh, the, the health of my neighbor is important. So rather than looking at themselves to have uh, the needs and the, the fruits of their labor, they looked at their, of, of themselves, they looked to their neighbor and said, I want to make sure my neighbor is healthy so that all members of the community are healthy, each of us looking after the other. That will ensure a better future rather than the personal health of that individual. It becomes a communal thing. So the, uh, the, the society begins to develop the seven gifts of the grandfathers. And you probably have heard these, respect, love, honesty, etc., etc. The four directions began to understand that there are four races of humanity in the world. And each race is given a responsibility to the east, we have the yellow people, more introspective into uh, finding out the internal workings of the individual, the um, incantations, the um, workings with yourself. To the south, we have the black people. And then, and these people, were given the gift of strength, power, 
And if you look at uh, sports today, you can see that working. You look to the West and you find the red race and they have the gift of spirituality. They're more into ceremonies. They're more into songs, dances, and seeking the aid of uh, the, the spiritual side. To the north, you find the white people, and they were given the gift of invention. And invention because they're very anxious. They want to go faster than time. So to go from A to B, they make a car. And then they make an airplane. Now they, make, they want to make a jet to go faster. Now they want to go, go further. So that, that's their gift. And we have to find uh, an answer to that, to those gifts, because within the spiritual uh, uh, side, we were given um, instructions that if we are to find uh, safety, the reason for being on this world, the reason to have life and awareness, we have to begin holding hands with each other. And we have an illustration placing all the four races on each corner and between uh, peop other figures until the whole circle is holding hands. Now that's how you find the, the solution to sustainability. And then we had, um, for the children, we give them symbolism. We say, touch a rock. Look at the mountain. What does that remind you of? The strength, the personal strength that each individual has. Then you go further down, you find trees. All trees attempt to stand tall and straight, seeking the gift of the sun. And that is an honest way to live, straight and tall. So that gives us a reminder that we must be honest in our dealings with everybody. Then we go further down and we find grass. Grass is a teaching. And grass, you can do anything to the grass. You can burn it, you can stomp on it, you can cut it, you can do whatever damage you want to the grass, but the grass will not respond except to begin to show up again, to begin to grow again, to begin to show up. And, um, and then further down, you have the fire. Fire is loving your neighbor. So show love to everybody. <clears throat> we have also legends to, that uh, gives uh, everybody to know about Chahabesh, to know about Hanoi, to know about Wemishush, Wisakichak. And uh, we also have the fasting, the, uh, the smudging, uh, two-step dances. Those are social dances to make everybody happy. And share, share what you have. So when you're in that kind of celebration mode, it's very hard to accumulate all, the, all for yourself. Because you, be, you begin to think of other entities. And um, water, we call her our little sister. And uh, we find other um, people around us to share. Let's say the Inuit. There was a trip every so often. Did you ever think of the Inuit and the kayaks? Kayaks, the frame of the kayak could not have been done with the bones because they're not that uniform. Uh, they're heavy and hard to bend. So it's very hard to find uniform um, pieces that will form the left side and the right side. 
So the in and out of James Bay made a periodic trip from here to big the to bring the birch tree north. And they carried all this uh, birch and they delivered it to the uh, Inuit in exchange for items that the Inuit could, could give them. So that was uh, other things that were exchanged like uh, tobacco. Uh, we went a year and a half one way to trade with the, our little brothers with tails. We don't know what, the, what they are, but it's a year and a half to go down, a year and a half to return to uh, bring uh, supplies and needs for the, the half moon ceremony. So this was done and dress, dress was done with care. You put the uh, beads, you put the frills, you prepare the hide, you make it soft. And when, we, when you do that, that means somebody had time to do that, somebody was in a good frame of mind to do that, and somebody wanted their men, their women, their children to look nice during the next dance. So everybody wanted to present themselves in a good way, and everybody wanted other people to be presented in a good way. So this, everything was made from, uh, the, from caps, mitts, uh, vests, and coats. And uh, the people, they did all that in celebration. And uh, spirituality. Spirituality is being able to see the tree. What does an, a tree actually look like? A tree and all its uh, colors and uh, the... Um, the lines that go along with it, that go along the tree, uh, the makeup of the tree, very colorful. And when you see something like that, you have pretty close seen creation. And then there are, uh, for, for the healing component, the con continuity, you have the lodges, you have a healer, you have to advise on what you bring in. Of course, you have a conscience so you have, you know, right and left. And you know the difference between a good heart and a bad heart. And uh, so in terms of sustainability, the strength of the individual and the realization, as Plato says, the flaming chariot in the sky, those things are bound to come again. And they're here now. And they said, Wisagajah, when he was returning north, he said, I will be back. And when I come back, I will be a little bit rough. So each and every one of you, uh, my advice is to find somewhere where survival is, has a better chance, um, better odds of surviving in that area, but uh, that's up to you to find out. So I think we have to strengthen each and every one and strength, strengthen the, the community and those in the circle that we travel in. Uh, I'll say that for now. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Ed, very much. Um, Robert, do you want to go next? Yeah, sure. Um, so I, I just want to, I have to start off by saying, uh, you know, how special it is for me as a high school teacher uh, and as a former president of the Concordia Student Union uh, to be invited back to do a talk with the Concordia Student Union by two, uh, well, by one of my former students uh, who is on an executive with another of my former students, Isaiah Joyner. Uh, and so, of course, I'm referring to Malcolm there. Um, so I, I wanted to talk, um, you know, back when I, uh, last year when I ran um, in NDG Westmount uh, for the Green Party, um, you know, I did do some talks going to different CJAPs and, and my talks were really focused on the, the climate science and, uh, you know, which I have to say was a, a pretty heavy topic. And given that we've got a lot of heaviness in the world today, I thought it would be good uh, to focus maybe on a more kind of positive story today. 
um, and one that that actually um, has has recently sort of come into the news, even if it's been sort of uh, briefly in the news. Um, and so the the positive story that I want to talk about today um, has to do with with one of the questions that I encountered uh, when I was campaigning and, and knocking on doors. So, you know, when I would go in and knock on doors and, and talk to them about the Green Party, uh, you know, a lot of what I was talking about is the ambitious plans that we had uh, to transform the economy, uh, to, to meet the targets that have been laid out by the IPCC, uh, and to move Canada rapidly in the direction of a more sustainable economy. And the, the question that, that would often come to me is like, well, how are you going to pay for that? Um, and, you know, that the, the answer to that question, um, until fairly recently, has been very much uh, focused, or at least when people try to answer that question, they've been focused on uh, the fiscal policy of the federal government. So by that, I'm meaning the taxes that are being brought in and the money that's being, being spent. And um, limiting that the discussion about how to pay for what you know is is being referred to increasingly as a green new deal, limiting that discussion to fiscal policy um, is is really limiting the possibilities that we have as a country. And so the the thing that has happened recently that that has given me a fair amount of hope. Um, is that the federal government of Canada has, uh, just in the last several months, uh, as part of its response to the, the COVID-19 crisis, um, decided to approach this crisis not just with fiscal policy, but also with monetary policy. And so what I mean by that is that um, the government of Canada uh, has uh, the ability to use the Bank of Canada, which is a, a crown corporation, essentially to, to offer it interest-free loans. So the way that that works is, is basically that the Bank of Canada, you know, one branch of our government, um, creates money and buys uh, up government bonds, and it registers those as assets and then transfers that same amount of money into the government's coffers. And what, what that means is, and, and just to say, so since I, I believe it was March, uh, the Trudeau government has been using the Bank of Canada for about $5 billion per week in interest-free loans. And the reason that this gives me hope is not so much because I think that the Trudeau government is going to use this powerful tool uh, to do all the things that we need to do. I have little faith that that's going to happen, uh, but rather that it, it opens the doors of possibility about what can be achieved. Uh, because if the government, you know, as is, is right now being shown, um, you know, has this ability to basically create money and, you know, spend it into existence on things that Canadians need, then this means several things. One thing that it means is that the narrative that, that, that the media and that, that neoliberal governments for the last 20 or 30 years have been telling us that we have limited resources and therefore we need to tighten our belts and that we, we can't afford to spend on social programs and, and you know, spending on new environmental uh, you know, um, plans is going to be a difficult thing because that will mean raising taxes. It means that that's not true. <laughs> it means that we have a tool at our disposal um, that is, is able to create uh, the revenues that we need um, to, to, to spend on the things that we need. And the beauty of this tool is, you know, one, that these loans are ultimately interest-free, and two, that there are, you know, it, it's not even true that we would have to pay these, these loans back. So just for example, um, you know, the, the government of Canada would not need to reimburse the Bank of Canada unless it seemed uh, that, you know, inflation was starting to get out of control. And so, you know, when, when governments print money into existence, um, historically, there have been some examples where, you know, we run into a situation of runaway inflation. And certainly, as soon as you mention to people that, um, you know, the, uh, the government of Canada has this ability to print money into existence and spend on the things that we need, 
uh, certain people, the first thing that they'll say, they'll they'll raise this this concern about inflation, and they'll 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 you know speak about the you know the Weimar Republic in Germany before Hitler came to power and how you know r runaway inflation happened and people needed a wheelbarrow full of money to buy a loaf of bread, and so, but. I guess one of the problems I have with those uh, sort of cautionary tales when they're talking about the Weimar Republic and and certain other examples in world history, um, you know, about, you know, government spending money into it, creating money and spending it into existence, is that it, it actually ignores a lot of Canada's own history. And so this is where I'll, I'll, I'll put on my hat as a, as a history teacher. Um, and, you know, it's, it's amazing to me that, that very few Canadians are even aware of, of this. And, and that, this is partly to do with, you know, problems in history textbooks, but it also has a lot to do with, with what the media is not telling us uh, about, you know, government policy. So, you know, what few Canadians are actually aware of is that, um, you know, the Bank of Canada buying government bonds, so again, this amounts to interest-free loans, is basically the way Canada was able to pull itself out of the Great Depression. It's the way that we financed the massive expenses that were related to World War II. And even in the post-war era, it was the primary engine uh, driving, for example, the construction of most of Canada's modern infrastructure. And the reason why I bring this up is during that period where, where Canada was using this, this extremely powerful tool um, to, to pull us out of the depression, to, to win the second world war, and then to, to, to uh, you know, basically finance the biggest improvement in living standards in Canada's history in a very short period of time. Like it, this literally created the middle class in the post-war year. Um, you know, we didn't see uh, the sky fall when that happened. Uh, inflation was very stable during that period. Um, and, and government debt remained uh, very, very low. So the reason why, again, just to, to return, why this gives me hope um, is, is that, you know, we are a country right now um, that's, that's facing, uh, you know, a series of crises. Um, uh, and certainly the climate emergency is one of those crises. Uh, we're also in a, in a crisis of growing inequality. And, and I also believe that, that we are in a, an ongoing crisis of, uh, of our own failure uh, to, to address our, the, our own history of, of colonization and to, to adequately respond to the calls to action that have been issued by the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. And so, you know, for me, this, 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 this possibility uh, to be using the Bank of Canada uh, to, to finance, for example, like, you know, Canada's middle class was, was created by these loans and Indigenous people were left out of that growing prosperity. Why are we not using the Bank of Canada to offer, ish, you know, interest-free loans to Indigenous uh, communities across Canada? That's, that's a question that I have. Why are we not using int these interest-free loans to restore the deep cuts to social programs that have been done since the 1990s? And finally, why aren't we using, you know, the interest-free loans from the Bank of Canada uh, to start talking about financing a Green New Deal and, and transforming our economy, you know, away from fossil fuels and, and starting to make investments in the kind of renewable energy uh, initiatives and, and even, you know, changes to our agricultural system uh, that can help protect biodiversity. Um, you know, why are we not using that tool to do all that? And, and so, you know, I think that the fact that, that Trudeau is, is, you know, again using the Bank of Canada in the context of this, this COVID crisis uh, represents a real opportunity for us as, Canada, as Canadians um, to, to say to our federal government, listen, um, there is no longer any justification for, uh, for austerity. There is no longer any justification for delaying the investments in Indigenous communities that we've been talking about and not doing for far too long. And there is no longer any justification to not move forward and make the investments to transform our economy 
um, uh, in such a way that that responds uh, to to the, the the emergency uh, that the the scientists at the IPC CEC have been you know ringing alarms about. Uh, and and you know giving birth to I think the kind of Canada that that uh, that most Canadians want to see. Um, so you know I guess I, I would just finish by saying like the fact that the government is doing this right now and and has not yet spoken about you know investing in a, in a green New Deal tells us that it is not um, an inability to fix these problems that we are faced with. It is only a lack of political will and so you know until we can start electing governments who are are not um sort of brainwashed by by neoliberal ideology and who are able to to think outside the box and and look at canada's own history and see how we have pulled ourselves out of crises in the past uh using both fiscal and monetary tools um you know i think that that by by demanding that of government and by looking uh, to uh, to different political parties that have different uh, you know priorities, I think you know there is real hope that that we can address these problems. So um, so I, I just want to say that that I think you know we all need to learn a bit more about uh, the the potential that our government has uh, with this the Bank of Canada. And I'll just say, you know, a lot of other countries don't have a public bank. Like the United States only has its Federal Reserve, which is basically a cartel of private banking interests. We don't have to have a fight to create a public bank. We already have it. We just need to start using it again for the reason it was created. Uh, so I think I'll, I'll, I'll leave it there and uh, maybe, you know, come back to this a little bit in some of the questions. Thank you, Robert. Um, Ken, do you want to go next? Yes, uh, thank you very much. I, I really appreciate this opportunity. So I have a few slides that I'd like to uh, present. So I'll just start sharing. Oh, I cannot share. Okay, that's fine. I'll no. just speak to them. That's fine. Um, so I'm a, I'm a physicist. And unlike most physicists who study things that are either really, really small, like atoms or very, very large, maybe like galaxies, I study the climate system. So I try to understand how one can use the principles of physics to understand uh, how the climate system works, why the temperature is what it is, why the temperature is increasing and whatever. Uh, and most of my work is done in the Arctic. So I, I, I do a lot of work up in the Arctic. Uh, mostly uh, I'm interested in how sea ice interacts with the ocean and the atmosphere. Uh, as uh, many of you know, the Arctic is warming at a much faster rate than the rest of the planet. And this has really serious impacts for uh, the indigenous peoples who use sea ice as almost like a highway, especially for hunting and things. Uh, it also places incredible stresses on uh, the ecosystem. Uh, marine mammals like polar bears, for instance, that again, rely on essentially sea ice to hunt. Uh, seals require sea ice, you know, to uh, get to uh, raise their, their babies, et cetera. And, and, and so these changes are really are quite dramatic. Uh, and so my research tries to inform uh, why this is happening. Uh, and it all basically comes down to the fact that we are increasing the concentration of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere. Uh, we started around 1850 or so by burning fossil fuels. So uh, fossil fuels emit carbon dioxide up into the atmosphere. Carbon dioxide is a very special gas. It and water vapor are gases in the atmosphere that actually can uh, absorb radiation which is being emitted from the earth and would normally be lost to space they actually trap that heat within the climate system and uh, that's how the atmosphere is warmed up um, if we didn't have any greenhouse gases in the atmosphere any water vapor or carbon dioxide uh, the earth would be uninhabitable uh, the average surface temperature would be about 250 degrees uh, 250 kelvin but minus 40 degrees celsius so much much too cold for life to exist as we know and, and so when I talk to people about climate change, uh, what is important to understand is that when we speak about the greenhouse gas, greenhouse effect, there's actually two of them. There's what I call the natural greenhouse effect, which arises due to natural levels of uh, carbon dioxide and water vapor in the atmosphere. And th they raise the temperature of the earth from again, like minus 30 up to about 10 degrees Celsius. Uh, and so that's a very kind of uh, natural part of the climate system. We rely on it 
as a species. Uh, but what we're concerned about is that in addition to those background levels of greenhouse gases, uh, we're now emitting carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. And uh, one of the concerns is if we continue to do that, we'll continue to see more warming. So the earth, if you look at a place like Montreal or Toronto, over the last uh, 150 years or so, th these regions have warmed by about one degree Celsius or so. Uh, if we continue releasing carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, uh, the prediction is by the year, um, say 2100, we will have raised it by perhaps anywhere between one and three degrees Celsius. That's in a place like Toronto or Montreal, which is essentially in what we call the mid latitudes. If one goes into the Arctic, uh, the warming is happening at a much more accelerated rate and the warming there could be upwards of 10 degrees Celsius. So uh, when we speak about uh, climate change, one thing I just wanna kind of make sure that uh, people understand is that first of all, there are two greenhouse effects. There's a natural one, which is good and the anthropogenic or the man-made greenhouse effect, which is one that we're concerned about. And also when you hear about things like the Paris Climate Accord, which is limiting uh, average surface temperatures to two degrees above pre-industrial levels, that's actually on a, air, on a global basis. And for Northern countries like Canada, uh, because of this, this accelerated warming, which is occurring at high Northern latitudes, that may be upwards of six or eight degrees Celsius. And so we're already seeing dramatic changes in the Arctic and the sea ice. Uh, sea ice extent has reduced by about 50% in the last 40 years. Uh, and, and so uh, continued warming will only accelerate these changes. And uh, that's a real cause for concern. So in my own professional life, I've seen you know, this reduction of about you know, 50% in sea ice extent in the Arctic. Uh, and uh, it could be that in my children's life, time that sea ice will all be gone and that'll be an incredible shame uh, both because of changes that are, are, are because of the changes that's causing in the climate system but also to traditional ways of life in the arctic and also the uh, some of the ecosystems that exist out there uh, so thank you very much um thank you ken i have way too many questions that just come up from from these presentations along the questions that i had in my mind beforehand um Okay, so I'm going to jump to maybe one of the more important questions. Uh, Robert, I understand you were Malcolm's high school professor. So I guess my first question is, was he a good student? No. Um, well, I don't know if Malcolm was, uh, was uh, the top achiever in my class. I'll just say that. Uh, but he was definitely a good student in the sense of like, coming into my class every day with a big smile, usually a joke and a, a very kind of positive attitude. So um, yeah, I think, uh, you know, he certainly left an impression on me in that sense. He was just a, a real, a real positive energy in my class, uh, you know, when I had him back in grade 11. <laughs> I, I can attest to that. I've never met him in person, but I can attest to the energy, uh, positive energy part of it. Um, yeah. so I, I want to go back to what, uh, something that Ed has, has talked about, which is curriculum and, and, um, indigenous knowledge in curriculum. And I, as a high school teacher, I'm wondering if you can reflect on, on how these issues are, are, are handled within the high school curriculum. Yeah, well, you know, this is something that, um, the Quebec government has been, uh, I think, trying to improve a little bit. So they, they recently reformed the history curriculum. Uh, there was a major outcry from Indigenous uh, uh, people over the, the sorts of language that was being used and uh, the, 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 the way Indigenous people were depicted in the overall narrative. And while some improvements were made, I mean, they, they fixed, you know, like, for example, the term Amer Indian was not used anymore. Um, there are still major, major problems that I see. I mean, uh, you know, for the most part, like just for example, um, you know, the Métis people don't enter the narrative of Canadian history until they are uh, basically acting as a barrier uh, to the expansion of the Canadian state. Um, the depiction of, of the Oka crisis is extremely problematic. It, it sort of presents the barricades going up as starting the issue, not the land theft. Um, and so, there, there, you know, I could go on and on and on about this, but I, you know, for me, what what really need what I think really needs to happen um, because you know they, there was sort of a wave of consultation that did happen with that last curriculum. 
but it happened sort of after the fact, like after they had sort of laid out the curriculum, it was like, what, what do people think? And I, uh, what the, the root of the problem is in, in my view is actually addressed by one of the calls to action uh, in the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. Um, and that is uh, the call to action that is, uh, you know, demanding that in every province, um, see, like hired into the Ministry of Education, there should be a senior level expert um, and, and, you know, they, they say almost at the deputy minister level that, that is hired into the Ministry of Education that is there to, to, to be part of the process and, and make sure that these mistakes, you know, aren't being made. And so, you know, I was certainly one that, that spoke out a lot about the last history, history reform. I mean, the problems with this reform are many, basically all minority communities have been, their voices have been sort of eliminated from uh, the history curriculum. Um, so there, there are many, many problems with this curriculum in, in addition to uh, the problems uh, with Indigenous people. But one of, the th one of the messages that I had when this came out is that like this, this curriculum was being developed just at the moment that the calls to action, you know, were made public. And, and so it was just a huge missed opportunity on the part of the, the, the Ministry of Education, you know, not to look at those calls of action while they were developing the curriculum and, and to, to address them. Like Quebec could have been, you know, at the forefront of, of addressing these problems. Uh, and instead, you know, it is chosen to go with this, this very narrow ethnic nationalist uh, view of Quebec's history uh, that has, you know, problematic depictions of Indigenous people. I mean, the Sec4 history textbook make, makes reference to only two Black people. Um, you know, the history of Quebec's history of anti-Semitism has been whitewashed, and there are basically no mentions of positive contributions to Quebec society by any minority communities. So, so you know, this is a, a very large problem, but with, you know, with respect to, to the, 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 the problems uh, with Indigenous people, you know, the solution is, is, has already been there, is right there for us in the, the TRC calls to action. And it's just a matter of, of the government taking that seriously in my view. Robert, um, just to stay on the same vein about curriculum, and I, and I wanna talk about cur uh, curriculum that's addressing the climate crisis. I, I have a question for Kent. I, I know that you uh, held uh, different leadership positions within UFT as, as an associate dean and as, as a department chair. And I'm wondering, um, What's standing between us and an institutional commitment that all students would actually learn about the climate crisis and their curriculum at, at various levels, whether it's universities or, or other levels? That's a really good question. I think, um, you know, curriculum is mostly, I don't wanna to get too political, but it's mostly the realm of every department in a university. So historical studies has a certain, you know, perspective as to what their students should learn physics, you know, math, et cetera. And so it's really, I think the silos in the university are really what are holding us back uh, from that sort of uh, interdisciplinary knowledge. And um, I think that's really what it is. It's just that, you know, disciplines have their own perspective. Um, what's happening now, of course, is that there are people in history departments who study climate change from the historical perspective. There's economists who study climate change from an economic perspective. And so, people don't necessarily just study that, but it's still in a sense balkanized in that the economists, you know, don't talk to the philosophers or to the historians or talk to the physicists. And so that's really the challenge. Uh, at U of T, we have a sustainability master's program that tries to cut across these kind of traditional barriers. Um, but it is, I think it's just a kind of a mindset within universities that departments sort of know best as to what their students should learn. That's really what it is. Okay. Um, Edmund, I mean, we, we talk about, you know, um, communication in terms of the climate crisis and, and the science behind it, but the reality is that Indigenous peoples have seen and have been ringing the alarm for, for this crisis for, for much before science did. And I'm wondering if there's one piece of Indigenous knowledge that you would want everybody to, to learn about the, um, on how to address the climate crisis, what would, what would that be? I think we have to uh, accept the change. Okay. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Good. 
I think we have to um, be a little bit realistic in what is happening. We can uh, talk about uh, we'll be back normal soon. We'll be back to doing things the way they, we've always uh, done. But when we acknowledge the uh, the spirits and all things that uh, the living things. At one time, we will hurt um, the entities uh, so much that they will complain about it. And um, so if we look around today, we, we have to admit that they are complaining. And uh, I hear a lot of uh, comments like, um, we're doing things uh, differently now. We're going to adapt. We're going to change the way we do things. We're going to use uh, less highways and uh, work from home. So those things are, are changing. But we still think things will go back to normal. And um, for me, <clears throat> it's the change, the way of doing things. We have to adapt to these changes and prepare yourselves for that. So I can't see um, more money, more highways, more more things uh, solving this thing because it's bigger than all that. And we may be able to sustain ourselves for the time being, but um, accept the change because it's it's time. We've been uh, warned about this that things will start to change in 2012, and uh, we are seeing that now. So admit to that and uh, make some changes. Yeah. Best to do here. Yeah, it's just, it's, I think this is what, what has to be internalized that things are not going to get better. It's, I think a lot of the action is to avoid the worst consequences. Um, but change is, is happening. Um, so um, Kent, I wanted to go talk a little bit about uh, our critical climate and, and how this is a, you know, a decline in public appreciation of, of science and, and um, evidence-based policy. And, and I think we see this very loud south of the border, but it also exists here in Canada. And, uh, and this is also becoming visible during COVID. In Montreal, we had protests against masks. And I'm wondering what can the academic community do to combat this trend and sort of regain the public trust? It's a really good question. Uh, I don't know what we can do. I think we can, uh, you know, as as academics, uh, I think uh, I don't have any particular uh, agenda. I'm not trying to promote fossil fuels or not. I see the changes that are happening in the climate system. And I think all that I can do is just keep on reiterating to people that these changes are real. They're not, you know, fake news. They're not, you know, thought up by someone who has an agenda to make tons of money, you know, when doing climate research, that's not the way things work. And just, I think, just continue to speak the truth in hopes that people will understand, uh, you know, as, as Edmund said, I think, you know, um, we have, you know, so many warning signs that the climate system is changing. And I think we still have time to amel ameliorate most of the really severe changes but in 50 years or 60 years time, it'll be too late. And I think we have to just keep on reminding people that, you know, we have pretty good predictions as to what the future state of the climate system will be and that it will be a very different place than it is today. And we need to, you know, work as hard as we can now to reduce our use of fossil fuels so that we can mitigate some of the changes that are coming. The changes that have happened have already happened. And I don't think we can come back from that. And this is one where place where I think COVID actually gives us a little bit of an idea as to how to perceive things. So, you know, when, when we look at case counts in COVID, of course, we're, these are what's called a trailing indicator, right? It's lagging. Case counts are, you know, will turn into deaths in a week or two weeks. And, and so we're looking sort of always backwards when we look at case counts. And that's the sort of way it is with the climate system. And we see that the temperature is, you know, risen by so many degrees. That's looking backwards, right? Looking back in time. And that's essentially baked into the system. We have to look more forward and realize that if we continue to use fossil fuels, we will see continued warming in the future. So that's what I would call a leading in, indicator. We need to look forward. And so case counts tell us not what's really happening today, what happened in the past. 
the warming that we've seen already tells us what's happened from our use of carbon in the past. And we have to look forward and understand that our continued use of carbon will only amplify those changes that have happened. And we just have to keep talking about this in hopes that people will understand the severity of the situation. Um, and I'm not 100% confident that, that they'll do that, uh, but we need to just keep speaking what we see and what we know is gonna happen in the future. The science is pretty well determined. There really isn't much um, to sort of debate as to how, what the temperatures will change. We've known this, uh, the first scientist to study the greenhouse effect already figured out that the earth was warm because of greenhouse gases. And that was 150, 160 years ago. So the science is pretty much established and we just need to keep speaking to the fact that the science is established. There really isn't much debate about what's gonna happen and just hope that society will understand. But there's fatigue with climate as there's fatigue with COVID and I understand that. Uh, and people worry about, you know, the next few months or the next year or so, not knowing that, you know, there's this horizon coming at us and it'll be, you know, quite dramatic when it hits us and then it'll be too late. And that's really what my concern is. And, and I love that how, how it echoes um, what, what Ed has said earlier about, you know, we have to accept the changes that are happening. You're, you're essentially just saying what has happened has happened already and we need to be more forward looking. And I think there's a lot of synergies there between uh, indigenous knowledge and scientific knowledge there. Um, Robert, I, I, maybe I also want to get your, your insight there of what is the role of government in, in sort of combating that decline of public appreciation in science. Uh, and I'm from different angles. So there's a SciComm sort of uh, idea and open access of, of, uh, of research and the politicization of, of, of science in our societal discourse. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt you there, but. No problem. So, you know, I guess what I would say to that is that like government needs to renew its commitment to funding science that is in the public interest. So just, just to give you an idea, like, um, you know, under Stephen Harper's government, um, he made drastic cuts to the amount of uh, science that was being sort of initiated and funded by the federal government. So just, you know, for example, there was this experimental lakes project that they had that he shut down. And, you know, and while, when Justin Trudeau was, was in opposition, he actually spoke eloquently about the fact that that Harper was basically attacking uh, the government's capacity to to do science in the public interest, um, which is why it was so incredibly disappointing that when when Trudeau took power, he's done nothing to to restore that money those those deep cuts that that Stephen Harper has done. And the other thing I would say that that's kind of related to that is that you know. When the federal government is giving money to, to university research, there needs to be a stronger sort of directive that that research um, be, you know, have be sort of, again, in the public interest. So back when, even when I was, uh, you know, CSU president in, you know, the, that 99-2000 uh, year, you know, the Canadian Association of University Teachers at that time, was, was ringing the alarm bells about what it called the, the privatization of university research. Uh, requirements that universities were making that in order for, for research to be funded, you needed to find a corporate partner. And what that meant was that, that you know, the research that was being done was research that benefits corporations, not research that, that benefits the public. And, and the CAUT was also you know, ringing alarm bells about the fact that one of the side effects of that is that basic research was being underfunded because there was no, there's no real profits to be made in, in basic research, but it's what drives, you know, everything to do with, with scientific research. So, so we, I think we, we need to get the corporate money out of our scientific uh, 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 research and we need the federal government to, to, to make a renewed investment to, to make major investments. And, and just to, just to mention, I mean, you know, we're seeing what's happening with COVID-19, you know, we see so many of the world's, you know, you know, I guess medical researchers focusing on this problem of developing a vaccine. And it already looks like we are gonna have one of the fastest, you know, developments of a vaccine in world history. Now, imagine if the same kind of global effort was being, you know, made 
uh, to, to do research into, uh, you know, technologies that will, that, you know, will allow us to, to shift off of fossil fuels. I mean, we, we're already seeing massive advancements in the efficiency of, of renewable energy, of like, you know, new possibilities with respect to geothermal energy and battery, battery storage. Imagine if the governments of the world were making massive investments that, you know, that weren't necessarily related to the profits of, the cor of corporations uh, to, 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 you know, move that kind of research forward uh, much more rapidly and, and to, to do that at a speed that, that reflects the emergency that we're in. Um, you know, again, I think we would, we would quickly see that, you know, we do have the ability to address this emergency, but you know, in the absence of governments taking action, you know, if we're if we're waiting for corporations to solve these problems, we are not going to solve these problems. I mean, uh, corporations are the ones that have created these problems. We need governments to to come forward with solutions. Thank you, Robert. Um, Ed, I, I read an article um, in September that came in Ricochet that described sort of the severe impact of, of criminal practice, essentially of how a landfill is being managed on the Mohawk territory. And community is is sort of having a very bad impact on, on the communities that live there. And I want to get your uh, your reflection on on systemic environmental racism that exists within within our our community. Um, how, first of all, would you maybe um, sort of ex explain to people who are listening what environmental racism is and and how it impacts and how you have seen it impact marginalized communities? It's uh, <clears throat> the same environmental racism, systematic racism. It's a symptom of uh, the growing fear by everybody, uh, the government, the uh, big corporations, uh, the Canadian public. And you got to blame somebody. You got to say that uh, so-and-so is eating too much or taking too much of this. Um, uh, stopping us from uh, using uh, products that we should be using to solve this. But I think that's uh, a short-sighted uh, way of uh, looking at what's happening. We're ignoring, we're uh, sort of um, putting time, and uh, we're uh, trying to say that it's somebody else's fault. If uh, it hadn't been done this way or if it hadn't been... Uh, you know, so, so many things, or if we, um, certain segments of people were dragging their feet or uh, uh, forcing us to use uh, our money, uh, that's the fault, but that still ignores the reality of what is happening. I don't think the Mother Earth, the climate, the, the way things are changing or COVID, I don't think they know how we are relating with one another. That's, uh, that's beside the point for them. It's uh, when things are happening, we've been told a long time ago that uh, when we say Jack says, I will be back. And when I get back, I will be a little rougher this time. Well, that's how we are growing up in the First Nation communities and uh, dealing with um, the, um, the forces that are bigger than us. And uh, all we can do is um, try and find a way to adapt and make changes. Are we going to lose uh, many more people? Likely. But uh, we're going to say, uh, as soon as uh, this thing happens, we will be back to normal. It's, it doesn't solve uh, that issue. It still will be an ongoing thing, but there's also a, another prophecy that was given to us that the brother, the evil big brother, is um, taking too much greed, too much greed. That talks about the city, that maybe capitalism, maybe uh, the way things are done i uh, give you a little example. There's an apartment, might, might be a little apartment somewhere in the urban areas, in the Montreal, Toronto, whatever, uh, that's been rented. And that, that space has been paid for 
over and over and over over again and it doesn't help the person coming in because they still have to pay for the rent for uh, and a, you know a high rent uh, to be there what about allowing people to occupy that space and just say as long as you pay for the hydro and the maintenance of the space uh, you can live there uh, as long as you can that one change that we can do but if we are taxing people with too much um, too much demands on each individual then um, mentally they'll they'll be stressed and it'll be hard to uh, to come up with a, a solution a communication if we uh, all you're thinking about is I'm going to find a way to survive this. It's, uh, it's hard to concentrate on based on those things. Thank you, Edmund. I'm, I'm wondering, Robert, if you would weigh on a little bit on, on environmental racism and how government could be more conscious of, of, of its policies and how it disproportionately impact um, people of color, indigenous peoples, and so on. I think um, I attended a workshop a couple of weeks ago and, and the speaker was talking just on this subject. And she was talking about uh, redlining and some some of other practices that really, um, you know, would put landfills, for example, in in communities where poor people live. Um, so they deal with the consequences of of the consumption of, of uh, rich people. Um, and and I wanted to get your thoughts on that. Yeah, well, it this is really about the fact that that social and environmental justice must go hand in hand. And, and, you know, to, to achieve those goals, you know, we, we simply need a government that is committed to that, not committed to, to serving the interests of corporations and, and committed to, to sort of neoliberal ideology that, that believes that, that markets are the best ways to, to allocate resources. I mean, you know, the fact that, that we have a government that, that talks the talk of reconciliation and yet, you know, cannot uh manage to to end the boil water advisories you know it it seems incredible to me but but it speaks volumes to to this this government's political will i mean we've got uh you know indigenous communities that that are can you know have had these boil water advisories for for decades you know one of them is the is the six nations uh reserve that is like right between hamilton and st catharines ontario it's you know it's in an area that is is very industrialized and yet you know they've got clean water in hamilton they've got clean water in st catharines but on the six nations reserve they don't um, that that is a, a product of of a lack of political will to address the problem and yet when uh, when when Trudeau, you know, needs to come up with five billion dollars to buy a new pipeline, suddenly, you know, that that money is just magically there, you know, and and you know, I also think of you know, um, you know, the the Attawapiskat community where just next to them, like where we, where we've seen in recent years, you know, decrepit buildings that that don't even have that are infested with mold and don't even have proper windows. Uh, and yet right down the road from them is the Barrick gold mines that are pulling, you know, untold wealth out of, out of that territory. And, and so, you know, until we're willing to, until we have a government that is willing to say to, to the Barrick golds of this world, you know, you don't get to use that territory unless you're, you're contributing to the, the community that, that is literally right next door to your gold mines. Um, you know, we're not going to grant you the ability to, to, to have that gold mine. So to me, this is just this is entirely a question of, of political will. And and the same, it's the same political ideology that that says we can't do anything about the climate crisis is is the same political ideology that's saying we can't do anything about poverty. And and so, you know, until until we can elect governments that that are are, you know, not uh, not, you know, you know, I guess brainwashed by this this neoliberalism um we're we're not going to be able to move beyond these problems uh, you know ca the capitalist system is based on uh, on endless growth and we live on a planet with finite resources i mean it doesn't take a rocket science to scientists to say that these two things are completely incompatible and and it's time for us to to start you know, thinking about alternatives, and I've certainly been uh, been very hopeful. Seeing, for example, the 
the massive movement that, that formed behind Bernie Sanders. I mean, even though he didn't manage to win the nomination, what he did was he engaged masses of, of American people uh, in the political process. And I'm, I'm hoping that we'll see a similar sort of movement uh, here in Canada and that the movement that Bernie started in the United States uh, you know, will continue to grow and, and eventually succeed in, in achieving power. But that, that involves us uh, you know, also informing ourselves about, about our economic system, about the science of climate change, and about the crisis uh, in, in inequality that has been just growing rapidly since, uh, since the mid-90s. I do want to go back to the earlier conversation about science communication. And um, one of the things I think that are happen has happened in COVID is um, there's this government push to get quick access to data and, and, and just making sure that this is almost open access and share it between, between governments so that they were able to make policy decisions very quickly. Um, and Kent, I wanted to get your um, your thoughts on this. One of the things that, that Robert has mentioned earlier is how government should continue or invest more in science and research, uh, especially on areas of public interest. Um, and the climate crisis is an example of, of a subject that's clearly of public interest and that is mostly funded by, uh, by tax money, yeah, that taxpayers' money. So I, I guess the question is why is research like that is behind paywalls? Um, how, how can we address these kind of challenges? So that's a really, really good question. And um... You know, uh, as a as an academic, I'm frustrated by paywalls as well. Uh, the publish the scientific publishing industry uh, is incredibly profitable industry, and uh, it's it's a challenge to take that down. And uh, for instance, uh, you know, um, uh, I have to pay upwards of two thousand to six thousand dollars U.S to really get a paper published in a journal. Uh, and uh, that's open access journal. So that means it is available to people. Um, traditionally what happened is that that money would have come from people who are subscribing to that journal, say libraries or whatever. And so uh, open access puts those costs onto me as a researcher. And the frustration is the federal government has not provided funding to pay for those. So I'm stuck between a rock and a hard place. I want to publish my work in open access journals, uh, but I can't afford to publish it because uh, I don't have the research funds to do that. If I published a paper like that, I may not be able to fund a graduate student. So, so there's this kind of frustration is that I, I agree that the research should be open. Uh, and we try to do things like putting preprints on servers that are open to, um, to anyone to look at the research. Uh, but the frustration really is there's an incredibly profitable industry called scientific publishing. Uh, which is resisting, clearly that's, you know, re resisting any opportunity to reduce some of these costs. So I, I think it's a work in progress. Uh, some countries have tried to sort of work at this and often it's backfired on them. In the, in the UK, it's sort of backfired. They're their way of trying to, to promote o open access research because the journals just essentially took the money rather than from, you know, from me as a researcher, they took it from the government. And so uh, they kept making their profits will it actually allowing, you know, the cost just, just were shoved off to someone else. So it's a real challenge. I don't know the answer to that. Uh, we, we try to make our data available, uh, you know, on preprint servers, but there's copyright issues that often pre prevent that. Um, and, and so it's, it's just a difficult problem. And it's, again, it's a profit-based industry, which acts as an intermediary between me and other in, in, in individuals. And uh, that industry has to essentially uh, realize that they need to reduce their profits to allow for this research to become more easily accessible by individuals who want to look at it. And in, in, in my conversation with, with some of the people who work at the library, they, they describe this as a very unsustainable problem where, you know, the, the, the um, the journals or the publishing groups and so on, they just increase their, their subscription fees for libraries that, that would make this research at least accessible to the students who need to use it um, just arbitrarily and, and with, with kind of increases that are, are very difficult to manage. So in one way or another, the government is paying for, for access to that information. Um, and I'm just wondering like if you would advise 
and, and and another example. Sorry, this is a bit peeves, so which is why I get I get very worked out worked up a bit about it. Um, MIT um, a couple months ago, they actually ended negotiation with Elsevier uh, because it, it didn't meet their, their open access frameworks that MIT has, has recently adopted. Um, and there are a lot of what I see on Twitter is that scientists are, are actually boycotting Elsevier because it, from reviewing and from publishing because it's, it's one of those publishing groups that lobby against open access policies. Um, and I'm guessing if you would advise the government on how to fix this problem, what would you suggest? Like if you would just control the system and, and just what help, what would you do? Again, sorry, I get worked up. <laughs> That's a really good question. I get worked up, up about it as well. I, I don't know what the answer is to this, frankly, because there are costs involved in, you know, uh, you know, there are costs, you know, there are editors involved in things There are reviewers, of course, don't get paid. Usually uh, there are costs to, you know, typeset the, the papers and things and one one wants the kind of system to be efficient uh and i think the problem is is that it's just the markups you know that you know i don't mind an industry making a fair wage right i think we're all we're okay with that it's when industries are making incredible profits and companies like elsevier are probably making uh you know uh i mean i, I don't they're probably private they're making huge profits much above what many other industries do. So how do you how do you legislate that? I don't know. Boycotts are, you know, uh, the problem with scientists is that often we want to publish our work in uh, high quality journals because that, you know, provides more impact. It, it sort of uh, provides, uh, you know, opportunities for promotion and kind of advancement. And so publishing in, you know, there are many good, good journals that are not high impact journals. And the costs are not high to publish there. The problem is, is that people don't want to publish there. They want to publish in the high impact journals. And those often are journals that are, that are controlled by these large publishing houses. So it requires, I think, one thing that, that is happening, of course, is now with, you know, broadly based, you know, search tools, if I publish my paper anywhere, people are going to find it. Okay, that wasn't the case 30 years ago where, you know, you would look at science and nature and maybe the top journals. Now, wherever you publish it, people will find it. So I think there is some sort of pressure, you know, just naturally coming through the, rev the revolution in sort of publishing is that uh, I can now publish in lower impact journals and my work will be found. Uh, it's just, uh, I would prefer to publish in higher impact journals. So we're part of the problem is that, you know, there's a prestige to publishing in some of these journals. And uh, until we as scientists un understand that that prestige is mostly just the monetization, you know, that we just allow Elsevier to make more money off of us uh, and we should maybe go work at other, publish in other journals. Uh, that's slowly coming, but it's, it really is a challenge. And so it's a complicated problem. I don't know what the answer is, frankly. Thank you. Um, uh, Robert, I, I'm wondering if you would weigh on, on, in on that. How would you see the government um, addressing these issues? Um, for example, INSERT and others as a tri-council funding bodies, you all have open access guidelines, um, mm. but they're hardly ever enforced. Like they have had those guidelines for, for ages. Um, and again, it's cool. them, right? Like this, those issues, like who's gonna pay um, and, and, and the issues of prestige and impact as well. So. Yeah, so I mean, I would say with the, with the, the granting agencies, I mean, there's, there's clearly a problem that they don't have the political will to enforce their own policies. And, and, and that is something that I think government, you know, does have the power to fix. But, you know, with respect to the, to, to the, the private publishing, you know, industry, I, I, for, I am a firm believer that, it, you know, if an industry is not serving the public interest, if it's harming the public interest, and I think there's an argument to be made here that it is, I think that industry should be nationalized. I don't, I don't see why the government should, should allow, uh, you know, profit-making corporations to be directing, uh, you know, research and knowledge in our society. I think that those sorts of decisions, I mean, we don't allow private hospitals for a reason. We shouldn't allow uh, private seniors homes. And we, we, with the COVID crisis, 
we're seeing, you know, acutely why why it is that that model is is a terrible one. Well, I, I don't see why we should not, you know, have government take over the the, pu the publishing industry and and ensure that it is running in in the public interest. Um, governments have done that in the past; they have the power to do it. The only thing stopping, the only reasons to stop it or to not do that are ideological. And and frankly, I think those ideal ideologies are dinosaur ideologies. They're, they're ways of thinking that are associated with another time, and they don't respond to the current problems that we are faced right, with right now. I think Malcolm says he has a question for, for Ed after this, so Malcolm, maybe you can ask. Yeah, just a, just a question for Ed. Um, you mentioned earlier um, about capitalism and how um, uh, maybe that uh, you, you had a lifestyle that was focused on, you know, caring for your neighbor. Um, and I was wondering, um, like a lot of the issues that we're looking at right now are kind of rooted in ideologies of capital that are perpetuated by capitalism. Um, and clearly there's an issue with that. Do you, is there a model that you, um, that you, that you use in your community that is not based on capitalism and, and, and what role does that play in sustainability? Thank you. Well, it's, uh, it's not capitalism. It's not uh, harvesting and selling at a high price. Um, it's more, if you need something, what is it that I can provide uh, for you? So it's more like a barter, bartering exchange. And it, that's, that's a very long system. When we went to the Inuit to deliver birch, and they didn't give us money. Well, uh, they uh, gave us something that we would need immediately. So money was never there. And today, uh, that's starting to uh, to be true. Uh, there was one time that money was important, but it's no longer important. It's uh, much more uh, beneficial to uh, say, uh, you need something, I need something, let us, let us exchange and uh, you know, get rid of the middleman. It's, uh, it's coming into uh, use again. And it's, uh, at this time, it's, it's more reasonable than doing the other way. Just expanding on that a little bit, um, you also mentioned that um, uh, in our conversation one-on-one, uh, -on -one, you mentioned that you, um, you own a sawmill and that you that this sawmill you're not you don't charge for um production uh people just ask for the product and and it's uh there's no cost associated with it um how does this model like work like do you think that um uh related to what you said earlier about how you think people should move uh towards places where they think they could survive um do you think that this kind of um is uh, like, do you think that the city model doesn't work in the I in this idea of like um, uh, like a barter system that maybe we should move away from a city model? Well, the reason we lost um, the uh, the battle for um, a bigger share of the diamond business. Um, uh, the equation goes, you have the money, we have the diamond sitting under us, 50-50. Uh, Capitalists uh, died laughing on the floor. And the best they could do was 0.03% if we were de dealing in dollars. So uh, that, that is uh, their system. It doesn't work for us. It uh, never in the past, and they always find found a way to take the bigger share. Um, earlier on, there was a fur press, and the fur press is uh, if you were able to stack your furs to the height of the gun, which was uh, started at five feet or less, then you have purchased the gun. If your furs, after being pressed, or the same height as that gun. 
Uh, unfortunately, the guns got longer. So um, more demands on us to, to provide uh, more fur. So things like that happen all the time. So why continue a system that doesn't work for us? And uh, more to say, let's go back to the old way. Um, to uh, tell me what you need and I'll tell you what, uh, what I need. Maybe I need uh, some labor for to build my house or uh, renovate. And uh, for the mill, you need uh, runners, you need lumber, you need uh, other things. And uh, we will do that exchange. And this is working. And who needs money? If you, as long as you can uh, uh, provide the fuel and uh, lubrication and parts for your machine and do it yourself, maintain it, then uh, you're um, you're keeping it going. So I've had it for a while and it's still still in good shape. And we only deal in um, uh, the lumber harvesting. It's uh, the select cut. Uh, we look for the trees that are already losing water. So they're, um, they're dying. So we take those rather than taking the healthy ones. So we're very uh, careful of uh, what we do because we want those trees um, to be available for our grandchildren. And it only makes sense to do that. Why take all the money today when you can save it for your grandchildren? And in, in simply, that is the equation that we prefer. Um, I did want to bring up a conversation that was happening in a chat um, where I think Vicky was asking, you know, what happened in, in response to what Robert was suggesting in terms of government taking over publishing. Um, and and uh, Vicky was asking, you know, what happens if, if you have an anti-science government again? Um, and, and maybe Robert, you can, you can repeat your answer just for the people watching. Yeah, sure. So I guess the, the point that I, I made is that, you know, I, it's not that that government funding is necessarily a, a panacea in that sense. We do always have the risk of another Stephen Harper uh, getting elected. But I guess the difference between government, you know, running this and a private corporation running it is that governments are publicly accountable. We have the, we have the ability to then vote the Stephen Harpers out of office. We don't have the ability ever to to vote corporate CEOs out, uh, you know, private corporations are, are modeled on the, the sort of organizational structure of a dictatorship. Um, now, that said, though, there are there are some things that could be done that could at least, you know, slow down, um, you know, a reactionary government's ability to just sort of defund something that was set up. And there I'm thinking about, for example, like the way that the that the CBC has been set up. So it wouldn't be something where the the government is directly making the decisions about how much you know how much funding is going where but rather setting up you know an independent government body uh that that has a a strong mandate to serve the public interest um and so by doing that it would it would lessen the direct control of a reactionary government that would come in now of course that government would still have the ability to potentially like you know, undo this this uh, independent government body that's been set up, but it would at least require a few more steps to do. Um, but I guess ultimately, though, you know, we we do get the governments that we deserve in the sense of the ones that we vote for. So you know that, and that's that's why the message is, has to be, you know, partially that we need to become. Uh, more informed as citizens and more engaged as citizens and, and understand uh, the, the, the role that political ideology has played uh, in our crime, climate crisis, in our, uh, in our you know, social crisis of, of growing inequality, um, and even in our continued uh, you know, colonization of, uh, of indigenous people and, and, and the territories that, that they, they have. So, um, you know, I think that, that yeah, there's there's some political education that, that does need to be part of this as well. Um, I, I would like to get Kent's thought on that. I, I, I do want to add an example of, of a government managed publishing model that exists right now. Right now, if you have a corporation that's doing research, the patent 
this research uh, and make that freely accessible to the public. I think this is the whole idea of patents that, you know, the private, the privately funded research is made available for, for public benefit, not financial benefit, but it's made uh, available for public benefit free of charge, right? And patents are exactly. for everybody. Um, and, and so I'm wondering, Kent, if, if what, what would be your thoughts or concerns about these kinds of proposals? Um, I don't see anything uh, wrong with that. I think the the problem is is that um, you know patents are a little bit different than publishing uh, in that people essentially are sort of um, declaring you know their knowledge in return for some sort of exclusivity that that they can then litigate against if people uh, try to copy that. Publishing is a little bit different. Um, and, and I think, uh, so I, I'm, I'm just trying to understand the, the complexity. I mean, it's an interesting model because there are people like patent agents who review things and there's patent lawyers involved in it. Um, and there are significant costs, you know, to submit a patent. I mean, once one, you know, the, the cost, I mean, there are people who, you know, who help lawyers who help draft the patent. So although it may be free in the sense that it's free, you know, to the, um, to the end user, there are costs that the people who are applying for a patent are assuming. And so those costs are there. Those costs are there in the publishing, they're, they're there in the patent, it's just who's paying those costs. And so I, I, I see Robert's point, but I do worry sometimes that one needs sort of, I uh, think a wide spectrum of publishing uh, opportunities. And so I think what's more important is to educate, I think this came up in the chat, educate scientists as to opportunities to publish in uh, journals or learned societies. So many learned societies have much lower cost structures than do the commercial houses. And so publishing in those learned societies journals, which are often just as good, come with lower costs. And, and so that's another opportunity because they're not, you know, there's not a profit there. They're just trying to cover their costs. And so I guess I would just more try to inform uh, scientists as to other opportunities since I just know this I mean I know that I publish mostly in learned journals because the costs are just lower uh, the other thing which of course one has to realize is that Canada is a very small country and much of the publishing industry's costs and their profits are based on other models like the United States where there's much more you know money available for research than there's in Canada and, and so as Canadians we're as usual we're kind of stuck between a rock and a hard place in that the publishing in industry assumes that uh, you know that a scientist has funds to publish, you know, in in high impact journals, which may be the case for uh, people, let's say, in the United States or maybe in Germany. But in Canada, our our whole research funding structure is quite a bit different, and we just don't have that capacity to publish there. And and, and so, I think it's a it's a variety of things, uh, but I think it's mostly educating people as to other opportunities where they could publish at lower cost. And trust me, scientists are business people in some sense because we have a fixed budget. And so, you know, I can't publish, you know, five papers a year at $6,000 a paper, I don't have the money. So I look for opportunities to publish in these kind of in, in, in uh, high quality journals that are cheaper. So we're doing that now. And I think uh, that's one way that perhaps we can put pressure on the high impact, the Elsevier's of the world by publishing in, science, in learned society journals, which are just as, high quality, uh, but lower costs, and then taking away essentially some of the profits that are flowing to these large uh, multinational publishing houses like Elsevier. Okay. Um, okay, so I think we have about seven minutes left and I have a lot of questions. I was actually talking to Malcolm in the private chat. I find this super interesting. I would like to invite you all to my living room over Christmas so that we can chat a little bit more. Um, but um, I guess I, I want to jump into um, sort of a personal question that I have a struggle with. Um, and, and my question is to add, so I came from Egypt about 13 years ago, um, and I'm only slowly starting to learn about indigenous knowledge and indigenous history just now, not, not because of my curriculum at CGEP or university, not at all. And I'm wondering what's your advice to me? And, and you know, I, I see I see the same issues with Canadians who are born here who had a lot more opportunities to learn uh, than I did, but it's surprising how little they know about these issues. And I, I just wanted to get your, your advice um, on how I can learn more and, and better. 
I see. Wait, just... your mic. My my advice would be a little bit harsh, and uh, you don't have to take it, but uh, you have to eliminate the middleman, which is uh, never mind the government, and also universities uh, will do this, uh, but it's like a a very slow elephant. Uh, we have been uh, visited uh, by the um, colonial people. 500 years now. Mona Magish Kunis is of Tamukka, Mana A. Mahish Chicknish, the Bogo, Mona Giskin, the Muktani to a Chick, Jimeno Waho Chigachik. So that, that is uh, the problem communication. Uh, they've been here for 500 years and they still uh, don't know how to say hello in uh, in our language. So it's that um, resistance to us and the uh, con continuous attempt to uh, put us away, uh, keep us silent and uh, put us in a program to, to minimize uh, influence. And we still find ourselves in that uh, corner and uh, unable to do anything. So for those people that uh, want to find out about us, uh, you got to come to us directly and uh, ask or visit or work with us and also inform us uh, where you are, what your organization is, and we can establish uh, communication lines that way. But I don't think we can help the uh, the people that uh, came here first and uh, overrode everything that they will all of a sudden uh, be willing to communicate with us and or help us uh, uh, be strong. Um, they will call it reconciliation, but that um, again, that's a term that will take a long time and that's what they keep saying. But um, after 500 years, uh, not much will change. Actually, I think they will get a little bit worse because now we're fearing that we're going to be losing our resources and our stability and things that we are uh, used to. So we welcome your help and uh, we welcome your uh, your visit and um, we'll let's, let's talk. Thank you. Thank you. I believe also uh, we're losing the, uh, the space. Uh, we had a certain time for it. So uh, I want to say thank you very much to the other uh, speakers. Thank you for your knowledge. And I hope I was able to say something a little bit that can uh, help uh, the discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us, Edmund. I really appreciate your time. Thank you very much, Edmund. It is, it's a pleasure to, to get to learn from you and, and, and talk with you during this, um, this event. And, and I hope we, we get to talk uh, again and, and get to learn more. Um, I want to build on something that Ed has said in terms of, of, uh, of going to visit uh, Indigenous um, communities and, and getting to learn. Um, Kent, you, your work at the Arctic, as there are Indigenous communities in, uh, that, that live uh, in that area. I understand it's, it's not, not a lot of people that live in, in, in the Arctic. Um, but I'm wondering if you can reflect on, on your work and climate science in general, how can they develop synergies with indigenous people and collaborating with indigenous people um, on, on climate science? I think that's incredibly important and uh, it is a challenge. And I think uh, we have much to learn about how to engage with elders and people with that knowledge. Um, and, and so I, I as a scientist, it was not something that I was ever trained to do, and I'm trying to learn that, you know, as throughout my career. I think it's incredibly important that we do that, because, uh, you know, they have the knowledge of the land, they have the history, the oral history, which is incredibly important to us. Um, I've started working on a, on uh, I work up between Ellesmere Island and Greenland, and uh, there was amazing uh, history of uh, communication between the Inuit in Greenland and the Inuit in Northern Canada on, on Ellesmere Island. And they were communicating, exchanging technology and skills. And that's incredibly interesting to me because uh, the, way, the reason they were able to do that is because there was an ice bridge that formed between Ellesmere Island and Greenland in the past. And, and I would love to have learned more about 
the history of uh, those people's perceptions of this art, because uh, it would inform my research. And, and the challenge is, is that, you know, uh, it's just, it's a very remote place and it's very expensive to, to go there. Uh, and, and it's something which I think is incredibly important that we learn from each other. Uh, it's just always a challenge to do that. And, and we're still, I think, trying to understand how best to engage and how best to exchange knowledge. But it's incredibly important because they do have, you know, uh, I may have 30 or 40 years worth of satellite data. They have thousands of years of tradition in that area. And that knowledge is incredibly important to inform the sorts of things that I'm trying to work on. So it's a, it's a work in progress. We're trying to do that, uh, but I recognize it to be incredibly important work. Thank you, Ken. Uh, I think Malcolm wanted me to open the, the floor a bit of uh, to get answer, to get uh, sort of um, give an opportunity to if, if there's anything else that you wanted to add. But I do have one quick question for Robert before I do that. I'm sorry, Malcolm. Um, so uh, the federal government today has announced um, their plan um, to be carbon neutral by 2050 through a legislation mandating binding greenhouse gas emission reduction. Uh, reduction target, and I, and I wanted to get your your initial reaction, uh, Robert, on, on that plan. If you had a chance to to see it uh, at all, I, well, I haven't had a chance to go into the details, but I just you know off off the cuff, um, I I have I'm quite skeptical that this is a plan uh, that that really should be taken seriously by anyone. I mean, how how is it that you can continue developing the tar the the tar sands, continue building pipelines? and you know make the drastic reductions that the ipcc is calling for with you know in order to to meet those targets like those two things don't go together and you know yet further evidence that that trudeau is not serious about this is the fact that you know his reaction to to joe biden's election the what was his big the big reaction was oh my god we he's against the keystone xl pipeline you know, again, if if our if we're serious about getting off fossil fuels, we have to stop investing in the infrastructure that that makes the expansion of fossil fuels possible. I mean, it, this is not rocket science, but but it is it is uh, I think really duplicitous politics. Uh, you know, from the, from the Trudeau government, um, they are they are beholden to the oil industry. They are continuing to 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 subsidize the oil industry by about three point three billion dollars a year. Um, and and you know until they can stop you know giving those subsidies until they can stop you know investing our tax dollars in building more pipelines I don't think any of us should take any of these words seriously at all um, and I think we should seriously start looking for alternatives to this government because you know our children's future might just depend on it. And and begging from audience uh, brings a good point that the legislation doesn't actually include penalties for failing to meet the targets that. Uh, so-called binding um there you go so i, I want to give the opportunity yes malcolm yeah sorry just uh so we have to wrap up this session uh in two minutes um are there any things that stood out that we uh, you know we're asking a lot of questions but are there any things that maybe you wanted to touch on edmund uh robert or um or uh, kent um that wasn't asked or did we cover everything <laughs> i just want to i think it's a discussion which has to go on a lot longer than unfortunately the time that we have and i just want to thank you know malcolm and the other ones at concordia for actually sponsoring this i think it's really interesting and i always enjoy you know hearing other perspectives and especially perspectives you know from our our, our indigenous colleagues because that's really quite important so i just want to thank you um, for this opportunity uh, and the discussion unfortunately will be a long one uh, but i think uh, we need to keep talking and that's what's really important Thank you, Ken. I, and I would just echo that. It's been a real honor to be uh, sharing this panel with both Edmund and Kent. Uh, and again, just a huge pleasure to be invited back to a Concordia Student Union event by one of my former students. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you, everyone. Uh, we're going to end it here. Um, I appreciate everyone's time. It, it was it was an honor for me as well. So uh, um, I hope everyone has a has uh, took something away from this and uh, that you enjoy the rest of rest of your day. Thank you very much, everyone. Thank you. Okay.